Greetings, it's time for the annual update of when I estimate when a technological singularity will occur. This is widely anticipated. It's one of the most high traffic topics on this channel. And I've been doing estimates about the timing of the technological singularity going all the way back to 2009. Now, what is a technological singularity? It is a point in time at which the accelerating rate of technological change reaches a point that things are changing so quickly that they surpass human comprehension. It may not pass the comprehension of some artificial superintelligence, of course, but they may have the ability to parse time into much smaller segments than human perception. Similarly, human civilization could be considered a technological singularity from the point of view of animals, whether great apes or dogs and cats or whatever, because they cannot understand the complexities and nuances of human civilization after about 1200 BC or so, let's say. So we go to an article that I wrote way back on August 20th, 2009, Timing the Singularity. But in this article, which was a very famous article and is still cited as an important body of work towards estimating a technological singularity, I go through four different methodologies of how to approach a technological singularity, including one that has two vectors of my own estimation. So we go through the article. The first one is that we mentioned Ray Kurzweil. Ray Kurzweil is, of course, the primary proponent of a technological singularity and the most famous futurist out there. He wrote a book in 2005 called The Singularity is Near. He has not spoken much about the singularity after that point, at least in the form of books. And in that 2005 book, he made one very important chart, which is this one that we see right here. Let me tell you how to interpret this chart. The vertical axis represents time to each next event. Each dot on this chart represents an important event. So time to next event from each event. And this horizontal axis starts from the right and goes leftward. And it represents time before the present. So 10 years before the present, 100 years before the present, and so forth. And then how are these dots chosen? He has chosen sources ranging from astronomers like Carl Sagan to historians, to economists, to paleontologists, to software people to theologians, to philosophers, and so forth, and ask them what do they consider to be the most significant events in human history. And they put out a list, and he plotted on the list how far ago from the present they were and how much time between each one of the events there has been. And we see this surprisingly tight line, despite the huge diversity of sources that he has drawn from. This is very robust proof of an accelerating rate of change that goes before technology, before human civilization, all the way to the dawn of life on Earth 4.5 billion years ago. So all these very, very different sources have demonstrated an accelerating rate of change, even if they weren't looking for it. A lot of the people here don't even expect an accelerating rate of change to be so pervasive, but they have found it nonetheless. Therefore, we see proof of an accelerating rate of change. And when the dots on this line get to the lower right-hand corner completely, and this 10 will even go to 1, that is when Ray Kurzweil estimates we might have a technological singularity. So even project this out to about here, and you get an estimate. So then how robust is this methodology when we take it down to our modern times? So back to the article over here, I have more text about Ray Kurzweil. Now in 2005, he said there would be a technological singularity in 2045, but he has pervasively and through all his writings estimated that computational power per unit cost doubles every 12 months. And in reality, it was doubling every 18 months until 2013. And after 2013, the doublings have gotten slower. I believe it will revert back to the 18 month trend line as I discuss in videos such as this one up here. But he says 40 doublings would take 40 years. I say 40 doublings would take 60 years because Ray Kurzweil always tends to overstate the accelerating rate of change and almost by the same amount. And this error propagates through all his forecasts. People beat him up for having forecasts that said things would happen that have not happened yet, but they do tend to happen. And he's always behind by approximately the same amount. And that's why I think this 12 month versus 18 month doubling thing is the one error that he has made that has propagated through all of his work. And so if he thought a singularity was 40 years in the future from 2005, we just take 60 years in the future to say 2065 by adding that Ray Kurzweil discount factor. So that's one method. The second source, John Smart is the best futurist that most of you have probably never heard of. He has written some very brilliant things. And he went quiet for quite a few years, but now he's producing a lot of great output again. And in 2003, he wrote this very detailed white paper, which you can check out if you click on this link where my cursor is right now. He wrote in 2003, and he explained why he felt the technological singularity was in 2060 plus minus 20 years. He also thought that in 2019, 
More recently, he has chosen a later date, which I'll discuss later in this video. But the fact that he chose 2060 is noteworthy. Then we go to the third methodology, which some people have a great problem with. The Star Trek franchise is fiction. And remember, I have consistently always said that humans will never be on spaceships exploring space. It's going to be artificial intelligence in very small hardware devices that explore space. And that is the type of intelligence from Earth that will end up exploring space. Humans are not going to be on spaceships exploring space. Nonetheless, the Star Trek franchise has been in existence since 1966 and has given a lot of thought to many aspects of futurism. And many of the predictions they made from deep in the 20th century for the early 21st century have come out correct. Yet one question that they had never answered until 30 years into the franchise, which is to say 1996, is when humans come into contact with their first extraterrestrial intelligence. Because when I was watching Star Trek The Next Generation, that question was never answered. And I wondered when, when did humans first encounter an extraterrestrial civilization within the Star Trek timeline. And the reason this thought matters is because the screenwriters work as a group. There's a lot of collective thought. There was probably a very detailed debate about what year they would choose for what they consider a technological singularity, which occurs after a humanity that lost its way encounters a more advanced extraterrestrial society, namely the Vulcans. And they chose a date of April 5th, 2063. And after that point, humanity progressed much faster. So that became their technological singularity, even though it was triggered by first contact with extraterrestrial life. I don't think that is necessarily what has to happen for humanity in the real world to have a technological singularity. But the Star Trek franchise has been pretty good at predicting certain things. And the fact that they took such a long time to think of when this date might be, and they chose a date of 2063, is noteworthy. Now, there's always one or two idiots, never more than one or two, who say, because he just mentioned Star Trek, nothing that Kartik says about the singularity should be taken seriously at all. So nothing else I say about any video should be taken seriously just because I mentioned Star Trek, which is absurd. They're fixating on the least important thing they should be fixating on, which reminds me of a quote from Confucius, which states, when a wise man points to the stars, there's always an imbecile to criticize the finger. And that is exactly what's happening over here when they have such a problem that I use Star Trek as one of the dimensions to look at because the screenwriters there put a lot of thought into this, those people are missing the primary point. Now, we'll go to a brief clip from the 1996 film, Star Trek First Contact, where they discuss the date of first contact and why that was important in terms of turning humanity towards a much higher path of technological and thus economic progress. Sensors show chronometric particles emanating from the sphere. They're creating a temporal vortex. Time travel. Data, report. We appear to be caught in a temporal wake. Captain, Earth. Life signs? Population approximately 9 billion. All Borg. How? They must have done it in the past. They went back and assimilated Earth, changed history firing at the surface. Location? It's like a missile complex in central Montana. Missile complex. The date. Data. I need to know the exact date. April 4th, 2063. April 4th. The day before first contact. That's what they came here to do. Stop first contact. So that was Star Trek. And now we go to methodology number four, which is my own methodology. So I encourage everyone to read the text over here. There's two concepts that I want everyone to think about in detail. First is the concept of the prediction wall. Jules Verne in 1863 wrote a book titled Paris of the 20th century, and he predicted what he thought Paris would be like. And because that was relatively early in the accelerating rate of change, it wasn't that hard to predict over a century in advance. So he predicted things like automobiles, helicopters, air conditioning, and so forth, effectively 100 or even 120 years into the future. So his prediction wall in 1863 was 120 years in the future. He was not able to predict after that because with the data he had available to him, the most he could project out was about 120 years. But at that time, projecting out 120 years was relatively easy. Today, one cannot forecast that far into the future at all because the prediction wall moves closer as you get to a steeper and steeper part of the accelerating rate of change. So when I wrote this article in 2009, 
I projected out a lot of exponential trends, and I saw that by 2040, all of the exponential trends were either getting to the problem of large numbers, or they were getting to a point where some unification with another exponential trend had to happen, but it was very hard to predict what that would be, or was just getting too complicated to even anticipate the many scenarios. So the prediction wall in 2009, at the time of this article, appeared to be 2040, so 31 years in the future. So in 1863, the prediction wall appeared to be 120 years. In 2009, it appeared to be 31 years. That does not mean a technological singularity happens in 2040. It just means 2040 is the furthest you could forecast out as a responsible futurist in 2009. And the prediction wall gets closer and closer as time progresses. As each year progresses, the prediction wall doesn't move out by a year. It moves out by a little bit less than a year. And I'll talk about that in later parts of this video. So the prediction wall getting closer and closer is one methodology. And the definition of a technological singularity is when the prediction wall is pretty much down to zero. So you have two data points, 1863, 120 years, 2009, 31 years. And there will be other data points as we see what the prediction wall is now in 2022. And so then I proceed to go on to estimating what percentage of the existing economy in 2009 was high tech. So this is the atom type thought. What portion of the economy comprises of products that improve exponentially per unit cost year after year at a rate greater than 10% a year? So semiconductor chips, storage, things like that. And that leads to this table, and people interested in the mechanics of this can read all of this text. In 2009, I estimated that 1.5% of the entire world's GDP was high-tech. At that time, I called it the impact of computing. And that this 1.5% share was increasing at about 7% a year. Now, we want to take more conservative and more ambitious assumptions around each of those numbers. So if you think 1.5% was too high for 2009, you could take 1%. If you think it was too low, you could take 2%. Similarly, the 7% could be a six or an eight. And that leads us to this matrix, and this formula is underneath all of the blue boxes to calculate the year, which I'll show you towards the end of this video. This matrix gives us an estimate of the timing of the singularity as viewed from 2009. And the middle band, because I think 1.5% was the correct number for the percentage of the economy that was high tech and 7% was the rate it was growing at, was 2060. But you see estimates as low as 2050 and as high as 2075. That led me to think of a bell curve of probabilities of the technological singularity with the information I had at the time in 2009. And that led me to 2060 to 65 plus minus 10 years as the estimate. It's not hard to figure out what this means. This just means that 2050 to 2075 is the entirety of the confidence band. And the fat part of the bell curve is 2060 to 65, the highest probability part of the singularity. So that was what I thought in 2009. And as you can see, the date of this article's publication was August 20, 2009. So now in part two of this video, we will go to the successor article that I wrote exactly 10 years later. So now we go over there 